Welcome back to Casual EDH. My name is Chris, and today we're going to be doing a deck tech for Wilhelt, the Rock Cleaver. Wilhelt is an amazing zombie tribal commander. What he does is what zombies do best. He fills up the board, and you know what? He can even give you a little bit of hand advantage. Wilhelt is too generic, blue and black, for a 3-3 zombie warrior that has, whenever another zombie you control dies, if it didn't have decayed, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token with decayed. At the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice a zombie if you do draw a card. Now, the great thing about this is he lets you keep bodies on the board. As your zombies die, they come back as decayed zombies. Now, admittedly, decayed zombies are a little weak, they can't block, and when they deal damage, they sacrifice themselves. But there are ways to mitigate, get around this, or you know what, sometimes you just have enough numbers that it just doesn't matter. And the fact that he can let you sacrifice a zombie to get a card at the end of your every turn, it's kind of like having the Monarch but not having the Monarch, and you can still have the Monarch. And how do you keep your board presence, keep reviving your creatures, and you keep filling your hand? Now then, since this is a zombie tribal deck, I think the most important thing to talk about first is your creatures. So being a tribal deck, you do want to keep as many of your creatures as zombies as possible. But I think an important part of deck building is realizing when you need to go outside your theme a little bit to get things that help your theme. So I'm going to start off with the non-zombies in the deck, and for that we have four creatures. We have Yogmoth, Thran Physician, who will let you sacrifice your zombies to get a card draw, similar to Will Help, but you can do it at instant speed by paying a life. And this will also allow you to make decayed zombies, so it's almost like getting a two-for-one there. We have the Scarab God, who lets you get a bit of scry and a bit of damage in. Now don't be fooled, the Scarab God is not a zombie, he is just a god. But you can get a lot of effect out of them, you can even use them to get some stuff out of your graveyard if you want. We have Geralt, Visionary Stitcher. A lot of times, he, all he's going to be doing is sitting on the field and giving your zombies flying, but you can, if the circumstances warrant, pay blue and tap to sacrifice another zombie to make two token copies of that zombie, plus probably your decayed zombie. And lastly, a key piece in this deck, you get Poppet Stitcher. He is a human wizard that has, whenever you cast an instant spell, created a 2 2 black zombie creature with decayed which isn't a big deal. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you control three or more creature tokens, you may transform Poppet Stitcher, and when you transform him, he becomes an artifact that is called Poppet Factory, which says creature tokens you control lose all abilities and have a base power and toughness of 3-3. Three, three. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you may transform it. I don't know why you'd want to transform it, because the key thing here is it gets rid of Decayed, meaning that all of the zombies that will help makes lose Decayed, and then they can be sacrificed to get even more non-Decayed zombies. This is a key combo piece for uh, infinite draw engines, infinite mana engines. You'll see as we go on in the deck tech here. All right, and now we're going to talk about the zombies that are in the deck. We have 29 of them. That's not including your commander. And the whole point of this is just to keep bodies on the board. So the first batch I want to talk about are ones that give advantage, either with card draw or even some search. Uh, we have Sidisi, Undead Vizier, who has exploit. You can search your deck for any card. So sacrifice a creature, get a demonic tutor effect. Uh, this is great to get you key combo pieces, and it's also good to get you just some sacrifice outlet. You can also sacrifice the DC yourself. We have Custody Lich, who has, uh, when it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch, and whenever you become the monarch, target player sacrifices a creature. So it's a little bit of removal on an opposing player, but more importantly, it introduces the monarchy. So as I was saying earlier with Wilhelt, he does let you sacrifice a creature, then turn to draw a card. If you're the monarch, you also get to draw a card. This could be three card draws a turn without anything else. And that's a lot. Next, we have God Eternal Bantu. He has, when he enters the battlefield, sacrifice any number of other permanents and draw that many cards. So this is a great way to sacrifice your field if needed. Again, a lot of them are going to come back with Will Health's effect. And you get draws for that, which is fantastic. And you can use this multiple times because he himself will go back into the deck afterwards. Crypt Breaker, who has, um, importantly, tap three untapped zombies you control. You can draw a card and you lose a life. This isn't the most powerful effect because of the number of, of zombies you have to tap, but remember, your decayed zombies cannot block. So if you don't use them to attack, you can tap them to draw cards. And this is also just a one drop, so this is great early game to get down on the field just to have something. And lastly, for these ones, we have a newer card. We have Vogar, the Necropolis Titan. Whenever another creature dies during your turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Vogar. And then when he dies, draw a card for each plus one, plus one counter on him. You're going to be sacrificing a lot of your own creatures, so this is a great way to get a whole bunch of plus one, plus one counters on him. And then later on, a draw when he dies. The next stop on our zombie tour are cards that give us removal options. We're going to start with Fleshbag Marauder. Uh, he is a zombie that when he comes into play, each player sacrifices a card. Again, you do not care if you're losing your creatures, because you're going to be getting more back when they die. We have Murderous Rider, who is an adventure card that has, um, at instant speed, you may destroy target creature or planeswalker. You lose two life. 
And then you can also cast him as a creature, a 2-3 lifelink from Exile. And when it dies, you put on the bottom of the owner's library. So this is a card that will keep coming back. Even when it dies, it goes back into your deck. It also gives you some target removal, even of Planeswalkers, which is very um, important nowadays, especially with the sets that have come out recently. You do see a lot more uh, Planeswalkers than you used to, so this is a really good card for their removal. Ravenous Rotbelly. When he comes into play, you may sacrifice up to three zombies, and when you sacrifice one or more zombies this way, each opponent sacrifices that many cards. Sacrifice is very important, mass sacrifice is even better. We have Noxious Ghoul, who is an MVP in this deck. It has whenever Noxious Ghoul or another zombie comes into play, all non-zombie creatures get minus one, minus one until end of turn. It does not care if it's a card or a token. And since we are making a lot of tokens, you can easily get your opponents to be minus seven, minus eight, minus nine, minus ten, and again, Almost everything in your deck is a zombie. There's only four cards that aren't, so fantastic mass removal. And then, of course, we have what used to be one of the best zombie commanders, but now is a little bit better in the 99, Grimgrin the Corpseborn. I enters tapped. He doesn't untap during your untap step. You have to sacrifice a creature to untap him, but you do put a plus one, plus one counter on him. Uh, when he attacks, destroy target creature defending player controls and put a plus one, plus one counter on Grimgrin. So it's a bit of removal. I mean, he's already a 5-5 five, five body to begin with, so once you start putting those plus one, plus one counters on him, he gets very large very quickly. You remove whatever is most threatening on their board, and then you just swing him with another big creature, which means they're probably losing something else. All right, we also have three more zombie cards here that act a little bit like uh, aristocrats in a certain way. We have Diagraph Captain, who gives all of the zombies plus one plus one so he is a lord and whenever another zombie you control dies target opponent loses a life uh next up is gray merchant of asphodel he has devotion to black where everyone else loses life equal to your devotion to black and then you gain life equal to the life lost this can create huge momentum swings this deck is primarily black so you can gain a whole bunch of life while making everyone else loses a moderate amount of life and also with the amount of ways that you have to recur cards in this deck you can do this multiple times and lastly, for this little suite of cards, we have Geralt's Messenger. Uh, he does enter the battlefield tapped. He has Undying, and whenever he enters the battlefield, target opponent loses two life. He's great because of the Undying effect, because you can get rid of him, he makes the token, but then he comes back, someone loses a couple life. If you recur him a few times, it can get a little obnoxious. He's also only three mana for a 3-2, so he's kind, of, he's kind of beefy. The next seven cards we're going to talk about are either cards that recur themselves, or they recur other creatures. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with a couple of the more expensive ones. We have Haven Goldich, who has for one mana, you may cast target creature card in a graveyard this turn. When you cast it, Haven Goldich gains all activated abilities of that card until end of turn. I'll be honest, the second part, that's not as important as pay one mana, get a creature back from a graveyard. Probably yours, but you can take your opponent's creatures, which is nice. McCase, the Unhallowed. The important thing about him is that he gives all of your creatures undying if they're not a human. There's only one human in the deck, which means... Almost every card you have will undying, which lets them come back into play if they die with a plus one, plus one counter if they did not already have a plus one, plus one counter. And then we have some other cards here, like Scourge of Clan Nel Toth. This is a 6-6 six, six flying zombie dragon, which is great, because getting some flyers out is really good for this deck. The main thing is that you can cast them from your graveyard by paying two and sacrificing two creatures. Again, you don't really care if your creatures die a whole lot. They're just zombies, and they're going to make more. So this gets you a 6-6 six, six flyer for two. He does normally cost seven. We have Narfi, the Betrayer King, who gives all other snow and zombie creatures plus one, plus one. Does not stack with each other, so snow zombie does not get plus two, plus two. But he has for three snowman a return Narfi, Betrayer King, from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. That is an ability, so you can do it on an opponent's turn, which is fantastic. Next up, we have Prize Amalgam, who has whenever a creature enters the battlefield from your graveyard, if this is in your graveyard, you can return it to the battlefield under your control during the end step. Which is great, because it's another way of just getting another card out for more sacrifice effects. Next we have Edmundeth, the Draco Lich, who has Flash and Flying. And the important thing about him is that you may cast him from your graveyard if a creature not named Ebendeth Draco Lich died this turn, which means you cannot sacrifice him and then bring him back because you saw himself die. But anything else dies, including opponent's creatures, you can bring him back, and since he has Flash, you can do it on anyone's turn. And the last card I want to talk about here is another MVP for this deck. I'm pretty sure most people watching this already know this card. You probably saw it coming, but it is one of the most important cards that's ever been printed for zombies, and it is Gravecrawler. It is a 2 one for one that can't block, and it has you may cast Gravecrawler from your graveyard as long as you control a zombie. With your commander out, if he dies, you make a zombie, which means you can immediately cast him again. This is very important for a lot of infinite combos. We're going to talk about it later, but there is a Phyrexian Altar in this deck. You can sacrifice him to Phyrexian Altar. He makes a token. You recast him, sacrifice the token, sacrifice him, make a token. Infinite Colored Man. 
All right, next up we have three cards that are a little bit of additional token generation. We have Tainted Adversary, is a 2-3 with Death Touch, who has, when it enters the battlefield, you may pay three any number of times, uh, two generic and a black. When you pay this cost one or more times, put that many plus one plus one counters on Tainted Adversary, and then create twice that many 2-2 black zombie tokens. Uh, so you can come in and make a whole bunch of tokens, especially later in the game when you have a lot more mana. 2-3 Death Touch is not awful by itself, even early game, it just helps keep people away from you. Um, you do want to take time to build up your board. So having something to tell people don't attack me is really good. So he's good in either part of the game. We have Diagraph Colossus who has, he enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter for each zombie card in your graveyard. Uh, which is not as important as whenever you cast a zombie spell, create a tapped 2-2 black zombie creature token. Now remember, the tokens that these create do not have decay, which means when you sacrifice them, lose them, whatever... They will come back with Decayed when your commander's out, because your commander doesn't care if it's a card or a token as long as it doesn't have Decayed. And lastly, we have your commander 2.0, named Headless Rider. When Headless Rider or another non-token zombie you control dies, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. He does care if it's a token or not, but he also creates non-decaying tokens. So with him and your commander out, you're creating so many tokens it just doesn't matter. So the last six creatures I want to talk about in the deck are all kind of support creatures. We're going to start with Hordewing Scab, who is a 3-3 flyer that has other zombies you control have flying. And then he does let you get some draw in. It's really more of a parody type deal. You draw a card, then discard a card based on the number of creatures that deal damage. It's really more important that he gives you other zombies flying, as far as I'm concerned, because getting some evasion in this deck, especially when you want to swing big, is very important. We also have several additional Lord of beyond the ones that we've already talked about. We have Undead Warchief. Zombie spells you play cost one generic less to play, and zombies you control get plus two plus one. Cemetery Reaper. Other zombies, creatures you control get plus one plus one. He also has three tap. Exile target creature card from a graveyard. Put a two two black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. Uh, so a little bit of additional token generation. You're not going to use it that often, but it is useful to have. Next up, we have Death Baron, who gives your other zombies plus one plus one and Death Touch. Beyond that, we also have Overcharged Amalgam, who has Flash Flying Exploit. When you exploit a creature, counter target spell, activate ability, or triggered ability. So this is like a disallow on a body. And then lastly, we have Draugr Necromancer. If a non-token creature an opponent controls would die, exile that card with an ice counter on it instead. You may cast spells from among the cards in exile that your opponents own that have the ice counters on them, and you may spend mana from a snow source as though it was mana of any color to cast these spells. Uh, so now that I've spoken about snow mana a couple times uh, between the Draugr Necromancer and the Narfi Betrayer King, let's go and talk about lands that are going to be in the deck. I do keep eight each of Snow Covered Island and Snow Covered Swamp. This lets you pay for snow activation costs. And it just makes use of those cards. And since they're effectively just a normal basic land otherwise, there's really no harm in putting them over a normal basic land. Um, they don't even get turned off because of, like, Blood Moon or anything. So um, they're just to support a couple of cards. If you don't use those two cards in your final build for the deck, you don't have to worry about what kind of basic lands you use. All right, so for colored options, uh, we're just going to go through these in no particular order. Uh, we have Unclaimed Territory, who... Uh, taps to add colorless, um, or tap to add mana of any color, spend it only to cast spells of a creature type you designate when you play the card. Next up we have Cavern of Souls, who when it comes into battlefield you have to declare a creature type. You can tap to add colorless, or you can tap to add a color of any type to cast that creature spell. And if you do cast that creature spell, it gains uncounterable. Then we have Path of Ancestry, which comes in the battlefield tapped. It has tapped to add one mana of any color of your commander's identity, so in this case, black or blue. When you spend that mana to cast a creature of the same creature type as your commander, you get a scry. Uh, we have Command Tower, which taps for blue or black. We have Ice Tunnel that comes into play tapped. It's a Snow Island Swamp, and it has tap for blue or black. Then we have Sunken Hollow, which has uh, Andrew's Battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. It's also an island swamp, so it taps for blue or black. We have Shipwreck Marsh, which enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more other lands, and it taps for blue or black. Then we have Watery Grave, which is an island swamp that taps for blue or black. It will enter the battlefield tapped unless you pay two life. We have Choked Estuary, which will enter the battlefield tapped unless you reveal an island or swamp from your hand. Um, and then it taps for blue or black. We have Tainted Isle, which taps for colorless, or blue or black, but only if you control Swamp. We have Darkwater Catacombs, as pay one generic and tap it to add both blue and black. So, you know, breaking the pattern there. And then we have Temple of the Seat, which enters the battlefield tapped. You scry one, and then it adds, you guessed it, blue or black. First up for the more exciting lands, we have Feel the Dead, which enters the battlefield tapped. It taps for colorless. 
and it has if you control seven or more lands of different names you gain landfall make a zombie token we will have the ever-present pair of Urbor, two of Yawgmoth, and Cabal Coffers. Uh, we will have a Gaia Reach Sanitarium in here to give you a little bit of uh, card sifting. Myriad Landscape for a tiny bit of ramp. Bajuka Bog because it taps her black and also tells someone's graveyard to go away permanently. Exotic Orchard for anyone else playing blue. And lastly, we have Phyrexian Tower, which has tap, add colorless. Or tap, sacrifice a creature, add two black. So this gives you both a little bit of ramp and also a sacrifice outlet, which is a fantastic thing to have for this deck. So beyond creatures and lands, we're going to go ahead and transition over to artifacts. There are going to be 12 in the deck, and the first five are just a pretty basic suite of mana, either ramp or acceleration. Talisman of Dominance, Arcane Signet, Demir Signet, Soul Ring, Wayfarer's Bauble. We're also going to have a couple of more advanced sources of mana. We're going to have Ashnod's Altar, which you sacrifice a creature for two colorless, and we're going to have Phyrexian Altar, which you sacrifice a creature to add one mana of any color. Uh, based on our recursion strategies and our token strategies, we can generate a lot of mana very quickly with these two. We're also going to be looking to reduce the cost for our spells a little bit. We're going to have Bontu's Monument. A black creature spell, as you control, costs one generic less to cast. Whenever you cast a creature spell, each opponent loses one life, and you gain one life, so it also gets you a little bit of life in the mix there. Next up, we have Herald's Horn, which has, uh, when it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures of the chosen type cost one generic less to cast, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you may look at the top card of your deck. If it's a creature of that type, you may reveal it and put it into your hand. So this also gets you a little bit of additional card draw, which is super nice. Speaking of other tribal strategies, we have Vanquisher's Banner. As Vanquish Banner enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures of the chosen type get plus one, plus one. And whenever you cast a creature spell of the chosen type, draw a card. Icon of Ancestry, choose a creature type. Creatures of the chosen type get plus one, plus one. It also has three tap. Look at the top three cards of your deck. You may reveal a creature card of the chosen type from them and put it into your hand. So again, it's a little bit of additional ways of just getting more creatures into your hand. Now, one thing you might notice at this point is there's actually quite a few cards in here that buff your zombies. And this is important because at the end of the day, you are going to be attacking into people to win games. So knowing that, I don't think it's any surprise, they're also going to include a Coat of Arms. Now, Coat of Arms has some very confusing math with it for people. Each creature gets plus one, plus one for each creature that shares a type with it. So all your zombies are going to get plus one, plus one for basically the number of zombies you control minus one because it doesn't count itself the original one. But also any zombies your opponents control. And then your opponents have to do math because they're like, I have a human warrior, I have three humans, so I get plus three, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you're just going to blow them out by having so many more zombies that their math doesn't matter. Very important thing for Coat of Arms, it is an artifact. It will stay on the field for multiple turns. You do not want to use it that way. This is a sorcery. You play it on the turn, you're going to win, not before. Do not leave this on the field. It is not an artifact. Treat it as a sorcery. It's just an artifact because its border says it's an artifact. Do not play it until you're ready to win. We are going to have five enchantments in the deck as well. And to prove that this deck is not budget friendly, as if the Urborg didn't tell you that, we're also going to have a Rhystic Study in here, which is additional card draw. We're also going to have Rooftop Storm, which you pay zero instead of Zombies casting costs. You will still have to pay additional costs. So if your commander has been cast a couple times, he's not going to come out for free with Rooftop Storm. He's going to come out for free plus whatever the commander tax is. Necro Duality. When a non-token zombie creature enters the battlefield under your control, create a token that's a copy of that creature. Uh, this is great to get additional lord effects. It's just an additional token. It creates Maelstrom. If you have Necro Duality and Rooftop Storm out, it's ridiculous. Uh, we're going to have Endless Ranks of the Dead. This is a pretty well-known zombie enchantment here. It has, at the beginning of your upkeep, create X22 black zombie creature tokens, where X is half the number of zombies you control rounded down. So if you have five zombies on the field during your upkeep, you're going to make two additional zombie tokens. Again, it's just token generation. It's good. And lastly, we're going to have Bastion of Remembrance. When it comes to the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one human soldier token. And when a creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life, and you gain one life. So this kind of leads into a secondary aristocrat strategy with the deck. You do kind of want to punch people out, but you do have just enough aristocrat stuff to get people down lower enough that you can punch them out. All in all though, very solid lineup of enchantments here. And lastly, we're going to talk about our instants and sorceries. We're going to start off with our two counter spells. We have actual counter spell and arcane denial. These are just in there for gener general purposes. It's If you're playing blue, you should always have a couple of counter spells in your deck. I chose these two because they will counter anything. Um, you don't want someone to just pop off with a combo without at least giving them something to think about, um, at least forcing them to use their resources. Maybe someone else can help out with it or that kind of thing. Um, this isn't a control deck specifically, so you're not using these to control tempo. You're using them to just stop anything that's going to end the game. We're going to have three board wipes. We're going to have Toxic Deluge. 
uh, which lets you pay a, an amount of life, and then each creature gets minus X minus X, where X is the amount of life you paid. Uh, this is great to get around indestructible and anything that targets. We have Dead of Winter. All non-snow creatures get minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of snow permanents you control. Um, again, we do keep some snow basic lands in here. If you are not using the snow lands, if you're not doing the snow sub-theme there, you can just swap this out with pretty much any black removal spell you want. Um, I do like this one because it's three mana, so it does get around things like Gaddic Teague, although you don't really see gag take a whole lot anymore so it's not a big deal and lastly we have damnation just destroy all creatures they can't be regenerated we have three cards to give you search we have demonic tutor which is the og search your deck for any card we have vampire tutor which is at instant speed you can pay two life put search your deck for any card put it on top of the deck and diabolic tutor which is demonic tutor except you have to sacrifice a creature again we don't really care for sacrificing creatures it's not a big deal so it's basically just demonic tutor maybe even with some upsides depending on what kind of resource you have out on the field already um i do keep a copy of distant melodies in the deck you basically choose zombies and then draw cards equal to the number of zombie cards you control um it doesn't care if it's an actual spell or if it's a token we have army of the damned it's a bit of an expensive card but it does create 13 tap 2 2 black zombie tokens with flashback do the same thing uh, this can generate a lot of tokens very quickly. Um, just a reminder, if you have something like Phyrexian Altar out, you're paying 8 mana to get 26 mana if your commander's out. Because you make 13 tokens, they make 13 more tokens, which gets you 26 mana. So this is also a really good way to get a lot of burst mana. Um, you can even treat it like a Dark Ritual if you want. And again, it has flashbacks, so you can do that a second time too. Empty the Laboratory is a really fun card. You sacrifice X zombies and then reveal cards into reveal X zombies. Put those zombies into play. The rest of the cards on the bottom of your deck in any order. Great way to turn all of those kind of not as great decayed zombies into serious zombie threats. And we have Zombie Apocalypse. So this could have been in the board wipe section. Um, I don't count it as a board wipe because it only destroys humans. What it does do is get you all zombies out of your graveyard back onto the field. Um, fantastic recursion card. And humans are the most popular creature type in Magic, which means you're likely still going to get a few cards for it. So not only do you get all your zombies back, but you also get some fringe benefit from it too, which is nice. And lastly, because everyone needs to sigh more, we have Cyclonic Rift. Um, bounces all non-land permanents to their owner's hands other than your own. Great way to set up for the end of the game. Now, the, normally I would end one of these deck techs by talking about cards you can swap out for more cost-effective versions. Um, really, the thing with zombies is zombies are, I think they're the second most popular creature type in Magic. They have so many options, it's ridiculous. At the end of the day, you can customize this deck any way you want. Uh, whatever your favorite zombies are, you can just basically put them in. Uh, just find something that does a similar role as them, and then take it out and put whatever you want in. Um, as far as the more expensive spells and lands and things like that, that one's a little bit tougher. It's going to depend on what your local area looks like as far as what uh, your games are going to look at. Uh, maybe you don't need a Cyclonic Rift. Maybe you can do like uh, Evacuation or Aether Spouts or something. They're not quite as effective. There's a reason why Cyclonic Rift is at the price point it's at. It's an expensive card because it's a very good card. But if you're not playing against people who are very high powered um, or you want to play a more casual game, you don't need to have Cyclonic uh, Urborg is a somewhat unique effect. In that case, if you're not going to play Urborg, take out the Cabal Coffers. Uh, put in a couple basic swamps or something. It's not really a big deal. If you don't want to do infinite combos, take out the Altars. Take out the Grave Crawler, things like that. Uh, you just have so many customization options available. It's really going to come down to what you want to focus on in the deck. This version of it is optimized to be very focused at basically flooding the board very quickly and punching people really hard. It works very well the way it does, but it's not gonna be perfect for everyone in every situation. And I'm gonna say this with every deck tech video, is my opinion. There is no one deck you can find online that's gonna be perfect for you. You are gonna to have to put in some time and effort to look at cards that you want to put in that fit your play style. I can make the most combo heavy deck, but if my brain can't figure out how to make those combos work, I can't play it, right? So. At the end of the day, customize it however you want. Zombies is a fantastic option for basically making your own customized deck because there are so many options. Add in more counter spells if you want. Put in more control, make it a zombie control deck if you want. That's perfectly fine. I'm just showing you what I built and what works for me. Uh, so as always, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Like and subscribe if you can. Have a good day.